And just gen in general, our agenda for today, we're going to start off with kind of an introduction or an overview to some GIS concepts, just so that we're all on the same page, we're all speaking the same language um, as we go through class. Uh, then we're going to look at um, importing data as AutoCAD objects. So we're going to bring in some GIS data and it's going to be AutoCAD stuff, primitives like polylines, uh, um, polygons, lines, text, you know, those types of things. Uh, we'll look at some options to label those because that's one of the most common things people want to do. We've got all this data, how can we use it? And after that, we'll look at importing uh, some data as civil 3D objects. We do have a couple commands that let us bring GIS data directly into civil 3D as things like surfaces or pipe networks. So that, uh, uh, that's a little bit different uh, approach. And then finally, we'll look at connecting to data, which is similar to importing, but um, it's just a different command with different features to it. We'll have a more of a real-time connection instead of an import, which is more of a copy. And we'll talk more in detail about that stuff as we get there. Um, so as far as questions go, first and foremost, um, the lab assistants are here to help with questions. So. Uh, if you have a problem with an exercise, um, go to that first, uh, or go to them first. Uh, I will, time permitting, kind of take questions after each se section, you know, just one or two. Obviously, we can't field one from everybody because we would not get anywhere in the, in the hour and a half. Uh, but um, we'll take a, a little time for questions there. Uh, after the session, I believe there, I'll double check, but I don't think there's anything in here right after this session because the keynote is going on. Uh, so that means I don't have to get out of here super fast to make room for the next person. So I'll hang out afterwards as long as um, you guys want or have questions for that. Um, uh, via email, uh, my email address is in the handout. It's also, um, I'll put it up at the end of class so you have that as well. And something new that they're doing at AU this year is office hours. And I don't know, has, has anybody talked about office hours before in other classes? No, apparently it's taken off like crazy and it's, everybody knows about it. Um, it is an optional thing for instructors, so you won't find this in the app or under your, in your agenda or your schedule. But essentially it is a time that they told us as speakers, we can come in and be in the room that we had the class um, um, this, e this evening, 5.30 to 6.30, um, and just be around to answer questions. So. If you want to come in and discuss stuff related to this or stuff not related to this or whatever, um, I will be here. I will not be in this room. I'll be in uh, 3103, which is, I think, just a hall over, if I am correct on that, because that's where my last class of the day is, so I'm just going to stay there um, and, and handle it from that location. But if you want to, I'll make myself available uh, for that time. Uh, so, that should handle questions. Bottom line is, this week, I don't want you guys to, to leave saying, well, gee, I wish I would have asked about this. I mean, this is your place to, to do that. So, and if you do leave and you don't have, forgot to do that, my email address and contact info is in there, too. Uh, real briefly, speaking of handouts, um, I see some people printed theirs, which is awesome. I'm a hard copy guy um, as well. Uh, there is a handout in your data set folder on these uh, machines, which we will um, go to um, later on. So that's there as a PDF. It's on the AU app if you want to download it. And for the t first two people who, who want one, I have two, two hard copies. So anybody want, you were quick. And you're, and you're sitting way over on this side that you can't see anything. So I'm going to give you one. And would you just pass that back to gentleman in the third row. I wish I had a whole bunch of them, but actually Sam was nice enough to print some out and bring with, with him. So, um, so um, thank you for that, Sam. And uh, uh, at least if you don't have one hard copy, again, um, it's in the data set. So you have that, that PDF there and you can take a look at it. So in general, just a quick overview here of some GIS stuff that, uh, that is real important is to remember that Civil 3D, although it's one program, it's really made up out of three programs. Um, and 
that does make a difference on a few of the things that we're going to do or that you may do in general interacting with GIS data. Uh, because Civil 3D um, includes everything from AutoCAD. It also includes AutoCAD Map. Um, both of those are standalone products on their own. And then the civil survey tools that make up Civil 3D. So uh, with that, it doesn't matter when you install it. Obviously, it's one install. It's one icon on your desktop. But at these different levels, you're going to potentially create some different data that may or may not work with all of the commands in the entire program. You also may create some data that may or may not be able to be seen by people with other versions of AutoCAD. For instance, in Civil 3D, I'm sure um, you guys have all made a, a surface, for instance, saved it, gave the drawing to somebody who had AutoCAD, and they can't see the surface, right? Or they get proxy graphics or warnings and everything. And that's all great and fun, and, and, we, and we won't get into that. But AutoCAD Map can create some stuff that AutoCAD can't see on its own as well. Uh, for instance, um, the um, connected data where we have map bulk features, those aren't AutoCAD objects. They're not going to show up in AutoCAD all by themselves. Uh, also, there are certain commands within here. So, so for instance, the AutoCAD map commands, something like the AutoCAD map export command, where you would export data to a shapefile, it recognizes AutoCAD map objects and AutoCAD objects. It really doesn't know anything about Civil 3D objects. So that command, you can't export a pipe network because it doesn't know what a pipe network is. It knows what a polyline is and what blocks are and stuff like that. So there are some wrinkles in there that make this not look like it's, you know, absolutely 100% integrated. You know, we'll say it's 99% and it's pretty close. So just keep that stuff um, in mind. As far as bringing data in, and really this whole, the main focus of this class is bringing data into Civil 3D so we can use it, whether it's background data, whether it's for analysis, whatever. Uh, and in the level two, or the part two later on this afternoon, we'll talk more about using that data for analysis and different things. But there's three different methods that we're going to look at. First uh, is importing GIS data as AutoCAD objects. So we're going to bring in... A, any number of different file types and make standard AutoCAD objects, polylines, blocks, text, that type of thing out of them. Uh, then we'll look at uh, importing GIS data as Civil 3D objects. Different command, different options, we'll go through that. And then finally we'll do connecting to data. With all of those, it's kind of important to understand the data structure, which is this whole feature classes thing. And um, in general, I'm just curious, how many of you, are, uh, you know, have a GIS background of some sort? So a few of you. And the hands kind of, you don't have to be shy about it. It's not, you know, some I've never seen. Uh, but uh, for those of you who, who aren't or who, or who don't have that type of background and are, and are CAD guys, like, is very common within Civil 3D, the data is structured different. Uh, in AutoCAD or with a DWG, you might be used to having everything in one drawing file um, or lots of different things in one drawing file. You, know, you might have parcels, you might have sewer lines, you might have sewer structures, you might have water lines, water valves, all in the same file. Uh, and you have CAD standards, hopefully, but if but even if you have CAD standards, it, nothing kept you from putting the wrong thing on the wrong layer or skipping pieces of it or being kind of sloppy within the drafting thing. And we've all seen that, that happen, I'm sure. Uh, um, GIS is much more structured. And they have you know, what they'll typically call feature classes in different GIS programs. And the feature class is a very strict definition of an, of an object or a feature. So for instance, a sewer line would be a feature class. And that feature class knows it's a line, so it knows the object type, and it also knows whatever type of data 
the person that created it decided to define as part of the feature class. So it may know things like um, the slope of the line, the diameter of the material, the uh, material that it's made out of, or the diameter of the pipe and the material it's made out of, the um, you know, date it was installed, what uh, maintenance records, whatever someone wanted to define as part of the feature class would be there, so every sewer line was formatted the same way. The sewer structures would be a different feature class because they're not a line, they're a point. And they have different data like uh, rim elevation or sump or um, um, type of, of structure, you know, things like that. So keeping that in mind, if you go to your local city or county um, GIS department and say, I'd like to get all the data around my project in this area, you're not going to get one file from them. You're going to get a whole bunch of files because you're going to get a file for the sewer lines and a different one for the structures and a different one for the water lines and a different one for the water valves, a different one for the parcels and so on and so forth. So you get a whole bunch of these, these files. And we'll look at that when we do the import in just a minute. Um, it's also important when we talk about exporting, and we'll actually do the exporting in the part two, but it's important you understand that when we do the export because if you can't just take an AutoCAD drawing with all kinds of different stuff in it and say, export this drawing to GIS. And you laugh, but you know, I, I get phone calls all the time. Um, I just want to just click a button and make it GIS stuff. And it's like, well, you have to classify it with that and you have to export one feature at a time. If you just were to take the entire file and cram it into one GIS file, first of all, the command wouldn't allow you to do that. But second, it wouldn't be very useful because it would be kind of like when somebody gives you a drawing where all the objects are on layer zero, and you laugh because you've received those before. Um, you know what you said about the person who gave those to you. Um, we kind of don't want to use that as our model. So uh, it's important that you would export one feature at a time, essentially, and that you would have CAD standards in place so that things are on the right layer and formatted the right way and everything. And we'll get into more of that more this afternoon. Um, for the map import command, here's a list of all the different file formats that we can bring in. I'm not going to read all those to you because that's super boring, but you're going to see a lot of common stuff there. And now we can get, jump into an exercise. So, first of all, our data set, you are going to, when we, when we go look for some files to import, you're going to find it in a folder that is, um, Sam, help me out, remember, remember here, it's, um, is it right off C? Gotcha. So there's a shortcut on your data, on your desktop that says data sets. Inside of that, it probably says a lab number. Inside of that would be a list of instructor names. You'll find my name, Rick Ellis, on there. And inside of that, you will find four folders with the different class numbers on them. Ours, I believe, is the bottom one in that list. Um, so just to let me jump over and... Yeah, it is the bottom one. It is... Um, the one that ends with 8254. So you might want to, you know, make a note of that because we'll come back to this location a couple times. So hopefully you have uh, started Civil 3D already. I know most of these got launched before uh, the class started. If not, go ahead and launch Civil 3D. And we're going to start by just selecting or, or by creating a new drawing from scratch, a just blank drawing use the, using the ACAD template. So if you go to the big blue letter A in the upper left corner of the application menu and pick new, there will be a folder called AutoCAD template and inside of that is the ACAD DWT template. And the reason I'm using that one is because A, we all have it, and B, it is basically blank. There's nothing in it. So this is the uh, nothing up my sleeves part of the presentation as if I had sleeves uh, today. And 
you know, I don't want you to think that I've preset a bunch of stuff that makes it work. You know, we're, we're going least common denominator. Uh, um, the only thing that I'm going to do here is this template has the grid turned on. I'm going to go down to the status bar and turn the grid off, mainly because it bugs me, but not because you have to for anything uh, um, in this class. Now, the, um, the next thing we're going to do is change workspaces because uh, most likely this automatically launched with the Civil 3D workspace brought up. And with that, uh, the, most of these commands we're going to use are part of AutoCAD Map. And the AutoCAD Map tools are in a workspace called Planning and Analysis. Why the workspace is not called AutoCAD Map is a little beyond me, uh, but, uh, but um, planning and analysis is where we want to be. So switch your workspace up at the top to planning and analysis. You'll see, you'll get a different ribbon and a few different options then as far as commands go. Once you're there, we're going to go to the insert tab, import panel, and the map import command. So once you change workspaces, it's insert, import, map import. It may take just a moment to launch that uh, command to start with. And, and um, the first thing that we're going to do here is browse to that data set that I just told you about. So at the very top of that dialog box, browse to your data set folder, um, lab such and such, wherever it was, my name, and then the last one in that list. So everybody find that folder. I'll give you a minute because some of these are a little bit funky to get to. If you get to that folder and find that there are no files showing in it, and you think, I must have screwed up because it's blank, or Rick set this up wrong because he's an idiot, or anything like that, uh, change your file type at the bottom to ESRI shapefile. Then you should magically have the four files, or the five of them that are, that are in that folder. So, so you're going to see, based on uh, our file type and the fact that, that this was given to us, you know, classified as different types of data, you know, we've got a file for um, contours, parcels, pipes, streets, structures, and so on. Uh, because Autodesk knows that you're going to get probably lots of files, not just one to import, you can select multiples out of this list just by using the shift or control key. So I'm going to select parcels and, and streets. We're not going to bring them all in, but just parcels and streets are my two to bring in. Open that, and it brings up the import dialog box. This is the one where all of the cool stuff um, will happen. Most of the action in this dialog box happens in this table right at the middle. And basically, you will get a row in that table for every file that you picked on the import command. So if you pick 10 files, you get 10 rows in the table. Uh, yeah. Yes? Yeah, the question up front was, is there a way to import from a geodatabase? Um, you can't import, you can connect to a geodatabase. And so we will talk about that later. Um, um, also, you know, we'll, come, we'll give to it later with that. But, but good, good question. Uh, this first column is just the file names that we brought in. So if you picked some file that you didn't want to import, you can just clear the check mark and you don't have to cancel the command. Uh, the next column is the drawing layer it's going, that these objects are going to be created on. By default, it just names a layer the same thing as the file. If you pick 
that field. So if I pick on parcels, you'll see there's the little ellipsis or more button right beside that. Go ahead and click that. And that gives us three options here. You can um, create the data on an existing layer. So if you've got your template set up very um, carefully, you already have all your layers there. You can just pick one of those layers and run with it. You can also create a new layer, which is what our exercise has us do, or this bottom option, which I'm gonna show you that. If you wanna do this with me, you can. If you want to um, just leave it as the exercise has it and create it on a new layer, that's fine too, but, um, because our results will work just fine either way. But if I pick Use Data Field for Layer Name, what that does is it shows me a list of all the fields of data that happen to be in the file that I'm importing. Uh, this will be different based on whatever file you're importing and how the feature class and schema were defined. That's, that is attribute names that, we're, that we have there. Uh, so what I can do in mine, for instance, I'll scroll to the bottom and pick zoning. If I pick zoning, what it will do is it will create a new layer for me for each unique zoning value that's in the file. And then it will place the appropriate polygon on the appropriate layer. So it sorts all my parcels based on their zoning, puts them on different layers, and then if I went into the layer dialog box and changed colors uh, pretty quickly, I've got a fairly basic thematic map of parcels by zoning, and I didn't really learn very much about AutoCAD map or GIS or any of that. It's pretty simple to do. So I'll do that just so we can see the results. If you didn't and you just picked um, create a new layer, that's fine too. I'll pick OK. We'll go down here to streets. Click on it, do the same thing, pick the ellipsis button. This one, I'm just gonna put it on a new layer and call it ex-streets. So that'll make a new layer for the streets. This column in the middle, as we move over, continue on left to right, uh, object class. We're not going to use this one uh, just because we don't really have time to get into that in, in this session. But object classes are basically feature classes in AutoCAD. And you can go in and define what the feature class is, which would include, so you could say, I have a feature class for sewer lines. And that means it's going to be a line segment, it's gonna go on this layer, it's gonna be this color, it's going to have these four data prompts for me. And then as you create those, it would classify that for you and it's, um, uh, so, a little more advanced stuff that we uh, um, don't have to use here. The column after that, is, you'll notice, is um, input coordinate system. And you'll see this is filled out with a coordinate system. That coordinate system came from the shapefile. Our, our shapefile had a PRJ file with it. It had the, the coordinate system definition in there. This command reads it and says, okay, this is on, in this case, an Oregon South coordinate system. Uh, the reason it's grayed out and you can't change it is because up at the top, it says we don't have a coordinate system assigned to our drawing. Remember, we just started a blank drawing with the ACAD DWT. Uh, that's fine if you don't care about doing any sort of coordinate conversions. You don't have to assign a coordinate system to the drawing. If you know the coordinate system, it's not a bad idea to do it, but you don't have to for this command because it will just leave the objects in the coordinate system that they were created in and not do any conversion. If our drawing was in a different coordinate system than the files that we're importing, it would automatically convert from the, form, uh, the coordinate system of the shape file in this case to the coordinate system of the drawing. And you'll notice that is separate or unique to each row or each file that we're bringing in. So you could bring in five files that were all on different coordinate systems. You know, one was an ADD 27, another one's um, uh, UTM, another one's Latin long, whatever. Your drawing is on NAD 83. They all come together and converge and overlay and pretty cool, pretty powerful stuff from there. We don't have to do that, so we're gonna just leave it as is. Uh, you might, in this case of a shapefile, you might get shapefiles that don't have coordinate systems assigned to them. 
it's not a required piece uh, to do that. So it would be blank. If you knew the coordinate system, you could assign it to it. Or you can just, again, leave it blank and have it left at the whatever coordinates were that they were created on. Uh, the next column, though, is data. And this is a really important one, because under it, it says none. If you leave it as is, and it's set to none, you're going to lose all the attribute data on this particular file. So uh, we don't want to do that. If for some reason all you cared about was geometry, I just want some background data for my project or my a background geometry to print, you could skip this. But I'd rather have the data if it's there because I might want to use it. So if I pick on that first field for parcels, pick none, and then pick the ellipsis button. It's a, currently it says do not import attribute data, that's why it says none. If I change it to create object data, you'll see it automatically creates an object data table for me. It names it the same thing as the file. If you want to change the name, you can. We'll just leave it as it is. Uh, but object data in AutoCAD map is saved in the drawing. So there is no file management for you to do. Um, it's just there, it's pretty easy. It's part of the DWG file. Uh, it is automatically attached to the object that you import. So if you import an object with object data and then copy it, it copies the data with that object. Um, if you erase the object, it erases the data with the ob right along with it. And if you were to explode that object, anybody got an idea? Yeah, it's gone, right? Okay. So. Uh, Pretty straightforward, not a whole lot to learn about it. That is the nice thing um, uh, with it. So we'll go ahead and pick OK to create object data for parcels. We'll go do the same thing for streets. Click on None, click the ellipsis button, pick Create Object Data. Um, we didn't talk yet about the Select Fields button that's here. Go ahead and pick that, and it will show you a list of all the fields or all the attributes that are part of that file. And then you can be selective about what you bring in. Maybe you say, I really don't care about bringing in certain fields. You can toggle those off. So just to see that, let's turn off everything except name underscore full, uh, speed, and type. Notice there is no select all, clear all, right click, shift, you know. Uh, it's pick them one at a time. Um, unfortunately, that's the way it is. Uh, but do that, click OK. Now, somebody asked me yesterday, well, if I change my mind later, what do I do? Well, you erase everything and you re-import it. So, um, my kind of default is unless I'm sure I don't want it, I'm going to go ahead and bring it in. It's not going to make my file that much bigger. I would rather have it than not have it. It's much easier for me to ignore it than it is for me to just go back and redo this whole process. So um, with that, just something to point out, one of the things you might consider whether you want it to bring in or not is something like length. You'll notice there's length, or sometimes you'll have, you know, if it's parcels, you'll have area. Those are geometry properties. Uh, these values that you're bringing in here are going to be static text attributes. So if we bring in length, and then I edit that line and stretch it, and it's longer, this length value will still be the same. Now, there might be cases you want that for record purposes or historical purposes to know that was the, the record length of the, of the line. But if what you want is the real length as it is defined in AutoCAD, um, you don't want this length. What you want to use is the AutoCAD property length because that's always what the real length is. And it just depends on if you want the real property, or whether you want a recorded value. And that can get confusing 
uh, on there. So I just wanted to point you know, that out. And it also is going to be important when you start doing labeling and stuff, because which value are you going to use to label? Are you going to label with the AutoCAD property of length, or are you going to label with this recorded value of length, which probably was right at some time, but it is whatever it is in here. So just a thing to be aware of. Um, I'll pick OK to go out of that. The last column here that's a little bit off of my screen is points. Uh, we're not going to do anything with that because the data we have is not point data. You know, if we would have had sewer structures, we could do something there. But all it will basically let you do is assign blocks to point data, um, if you have it. So pretty straightforward. Uh, finally, upper right corner is a spatial filter. That's very handy if you have uh, a file that you're importing that was gigantic. Maybe somebody gave you all the parcels in the county that you're working in, and you only care about a little piece. As long as you've got something to reference in the drawing so you know where you're at, you can go out and draw a window and say, only bring in the data in this area, which will mean that the import command takes a fraction of the time, obviously, and, you know, to do um, you know, a few thousand feet as opposed to the entire county. Yes. Um, the only, the two things you have, you have none, which is what we have here. You have current display, which is defined by wherever you are, happen to be zoomed to. And you have defined window. So you would just go draw a window. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times what, I, um, what I'll do with it, has, has anybody used or uh, the online map tools in, uh, where you can turn on just an aerial photo uh, through the, with the Bing maps? I'll put a coordinate system on my drawing, flip the Bing stuff on, zoom in to where I care about, and then run this command and draw my window based on the aerial and then turn the aerial off if I don't need it anymore. So that, I'll use that to get oriented, but that's, uh, you kind of, I mean, it doesn't work very well in a drawing like I have. It's empty because, you know, we're floating in space. Um, so last thing here is this checkbox for import polygons as closed polylines. I'm going to leave that turned off um, just because I want to show you. Um, you have essentially the option for polygons, which will be our parcels in this case. They will either come in as polylines or they'll come in as a, a feature called an M polygon. And the M polygon um, or map polygon is something that uh, it understands complex polygon shapes. So if you have a polygon with a hole or an island in the middle of it, it knows that that hole or island is there. So when you list its area, it subtracts it automatically. Uh, if you have that done with polylines, two polylines have no idea each other are there. And if you did an area of the outer one, it would give you the entire area and you'd have to subtract the inner one on that. So often it doesn't matter a whole lot, but uh, I want to show you what the M polygon does just because you'll probably run into it uh, shortly. So just click OK. It'll run the import. Once it does the import, zoom extents so we can see everything. And you might be surprised that all of our parcels are filled. That's because fill is a property of the M polygon. And it's an, you have an option to turn it on or off. Now, most of us probably expected to see boundary lines on all the par parcels. If that's what you want to see, um, you just change that polygon display. And there isn't a button for this, but the command is poly display if you type it in. And it is in your handout, so you don't have to uh, worry about that. Page 10, poly display. This is also where that command line autocomplete is a wonderful thing because if I get about halfway through this, it will find the command for me. Poly display, uh, enter. You have options at the command line then of edges only, fill only, or both. I'm going to type E for edges only. You'll notice nothing happens. Um, with Civil 3D, often uh, things don't look like what they should, so we regen. And 
now we have boundary lines like we expected to have. You know, remember with Civil 3D, regen is your friend. So, um, now, if I go into my layer dialog box, back on the home tab, it looks a little bit different than the Civil 3D workspace, but on AutoCAD layers, upper left corner is the layer properties command. And because I brought in uh, those parcels, according to the data for their zoning, I don't have a streets and parcels layer. I have a bunch of these layers uh, like LD, MD, you know, whatever the different zoning classifications were in the attribute data. And I could turn those on and off. I could change colors on those if I wanted to. You could play around with that. I mean, it's just standard layer manipulation. So for, what, for us, I'm just gonna take EX streets and change it to red so that the streets look different than the parcels. Yes? Um, you know, the question was, can I add a prefix to those, to those layers? I don't believe that you can on this. It's relatively limited. Um, you might be able to do it with Lisp if you wanted to get in and, um, or it would probably be pretty easy to just do a script after the fact to, to fix it too. Yeah. This is not the greatest way to thematic map. I'll also tell you that. There's other much better tools for this, but it is, I mean, this is the quick and dirty one for, you know, this, we'll, we'll, we'll say this is my remedial thematic mapping that we're starting off with, and um, this afternoon we'll do some cool stuff with it. Um, zoom in on one of those parcels. It doesn't matter which one. Pick one, uh, right click, and go to properties. Just using the AutoCAD properties command here is all. And when you pick it, you'll see a couple of things. You'll see up at the very top, this, the uh, object type is M polygon that we had talked about before. It has all your typical AutoCAD stuff, layer, color, line type, so on and so forth there. Um, at the bottom, it has OD parcels, or object data table parcels. And then below that is all of the attribute data that we just imported. So here's all the info, and uh, this, is, this is live. So you can make changes if you wanted to. Uh, if I escape and pick one of the streets, you'll see that's a polyline, and at the bottom it has an object data table called streets, but it only has the three fields that I told it to keep. It's sorted out and filtered through all of those. Again, this is um, active live data. So I could go here to like the speed and change it from 25 you know, to 95 miles an hour and it updates the data for that particular object. Uh, it does not change the shape file that it came from because this was an import and it copied it in. Yes, sir. How did it get live? No, no. Or? I had a scenario where I did exactly what you did, but then a couple of days later, the information got lost. Oh, a couple, okay, so the question was, how could this information here get lost? Um, any number of things could happen. Again, if somebody, if these are polylines and somebody exploded them, that would take the information away. Um, um, if you try to attach object data to civil objects, like actual parcels or something like that. Um, that will appear to work, and as soon as the object updates, it loses the data. Um, if somebody ran any number of a couple different AutoCAD map commands, it could get, it could get stripped out based on you know, what they're telling it to do. I'd, I'd really have to see the situation. There, the, the way that object data works is it's attached to the object itself. Uh, so if that object gets modified in, in any way, you know, converted, move is fine. Move is fine, copy is fine, stretch is fine, um, explode is not. Um, 
Um, the question was, if you open it in AutoCAD Lite, is that a problem? Um, it should round trip, but depending, if you did a bunch of stuff to it in AutoCAD Lite, maybe um, on there. So I mean, I'd probably have to see it you know, specifically. It should be pretty stable, though, uh, with that. Um, so again, this is an import. It's not, you know, which is like a copy. It's not live. So nothing we did here changed the external database or the external shapefile. If you wanted to do that, you could export this and create a new shapefile out of it, and then your data would go along with it. So you could import, edit, make changes to geometry and data, export, and round trip that way. That's another option. Uh, but that then, uh, I guess, only bring in the attributes that you brought into the subject file? Yes. The question was, if I exported this, is this all the attributes I get? Absolutely. Um, on that. So that's where you want to be real careful with that filter thing. And I mean, it seems. Uh, you know, uh, maybe a little bit obvious to say, but um, a little planning goes a long ways with this stuff. You know, if you, uh, if you think about when I do the import, what am I going to use this for? Uh, that's going to help tremendously because A, you're going to know what command to use. You might not want to do the import command. You might want to do a connection or import a civil 3D data or something else. Um, also, if you're going to filter attributes, that would uh, be a big deal there too, of kind of planning what the use is going to be. And again, my default is kind of better safe than sorry. I'm going to, unless I really don't want something, I won't filter it out. Uh, the one thing I do tend to filter out is geometry type stuff because I don't like the idea of people having um, two different length properties because somebody's going to pick the wrong one eventually um, with that. So that's. That, that's where I would go with it. So we've got all this data in. The next thing that we want to take a look at is um, labeling it. And um, that's just one of the things you can use that data for. Uh, obviously, uh, we, take, we looked at it in the properties window. So if you wanted to create labels from all those parcels, you could, you know, copy and paste out of the properties window and put the label on each one, right? That would work wonderfully. And you guys are looking at me like I'm stupid. Uh, I, I did have a guy a couple years ago in the, in the front row when I joked with him about that, leaned forward and said, cool, and started writing down notes like he was going to copy and paste every single attribute data out into his drawing. Uh, AutoCAD map has this thing called a annotation template. Um, it's great that Autodesk loves to use the word template many, many different times, many different ways. This isn't a civil 3D template. It's not a drawing template. It's an annotation template, which is really just a block is all it is. We're going to be making a block that has attributes. We can link those attributes to object data, external database links, um, or AutoCAD properties. And you can have multiple attributes on this. That's going to be your label. Um, it'll insert a block with all these attributes, they'll be linked, and it'll automate that process. Uh, the procedure here will be that we'll define the annotation template. If you happen to have the same data that you're working with often, you, know, you can use that same annotation template over and over again in different drawings. It's just a block. You can copy it to different drawings or you can put it in your template um, so it's always there. Uh, then you insert the annotation, basically tell it what to label. And then finally, if there are changes, it's not totally dynamic. So, if you, are, uh, so you do have to run an update command. You know, it's not static and it's not totally automatic. You know, it's kind of a semi-automatic thing. So you have to you know, click a button and say update. So we're going to set those up. We're going to continue in that same drawing that we just used that has all of our parcels in it. And the first thing that I'm going to do is go to the layer dialog box and freeze the layer streets or EX streets. And the reason that I'm doing that is because when I get ready to label, 
I have to pick the objects that I want to label and tell it what to label. And if I pick streets, if we're labeling the parcels and, and trying to put a parcel number on them, for instance, or a count number, and I tell it to label the streets with the account number, it doesn't have that, so it's going to give me a block with a whole bunch of question marks in it. Which isn't the end of the world, I could erase it, but it'll be much cleaner this way. So, on page uh, 13, we're going to go to the annotate tab of the ribbon. Map annotation is a panel in the far left corner. Pick define template. So, annotate tab, map annotation, define template. Um, since this drawing does not have an annotation template in it, everything is grayed out except for the new button. So it shouldn't be too hard to find what we're going to click. We'll click on new, and you can name this thing, and you can literally name it anything you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'll just call it uh, number. and click OK. Because what we're going to do is we're going to um, label the parcel number or account number for every one of these parcels. Um, you can label any of the attribute data, that's just the one I've picked. This takes you into the block editor and uh, in Civil 3D they forgot to put the button in the ribbon uh, that we need. Um, it's in AutoCAD map. So if you do use AutoCAD map standalone, it's there. Um, if not, we'll type it. Um, it's in your handout, so you've got notes of that, but it's, it's map and text. So M-A-P-A-N-N-T-E-X-T. And um, autocomplete will help us out a bunch. If I could spell, it would help. Map and text. At the command line it says select an annotation or enter to make a new one. Well I don't have any annotations so we're just going to enter to create a new one. That's basically selecting it as the edit annotation command part of it. Uh, this lets us set up an AutoCAD block linking that data. So the first thing it wants is a block attribute name. Doesn't matter again I'll call it number or num Again, whatever you put there is fine. The real important thing is the value field. This is where kind of the magic happens on things. So if you click on the expression chooser at the end of the value field, that little button, here it says, what do you want to put in this attribute? And notice AutoCAD properties are here. So you have things like area, uh, length, uh, layer, color, elevation, whatever is all there. I'm not going to use that. I'm going to go to object data, parcels, and pick account number. That will put the account number in the field. When I pick OK off of that, you'll see that it has formatted this value uh, for us. Is, is anybody here a Lisp programmer. A couple of you, yeah. Uh, this is in Lisp, if you're curious. And you can use Lisp to format it. If you want to add prefixes, suffixes, um, change decimal precision, whatever types of things that you might want to do to it, um, you could if you know a little bit of Lisp programming. Um, if you don't, it's still going to just dump the, the value in for you. Uh, with that. So you can pick the text style, pick the height, we'll set the height to 10. You could do a, ro a rotation, you could do a justification on it, you know, left, right, middle, center, whatever you wanted to pick there, and then just pick OK. At the command line it'll ask you for the insertion point of this text. We're going to put it at 0, 0 because that's the insertion point of the block or the and when we insert all these blocks at the center of the parcels then that's where the text will go. It's important to remember this is just a block. 
So if you wanted to do that same command again and make a second attribute, you know, maybe you wanted to put um, uh, improved value or zoning or something else on that label, you just run that same command again, pick a different field that we're linking it to, and then just tell it where to place the text. So you could have multiple values you know, related to each other in any configuration you really want. You could also draw stuff in here. You want to put a big circle around it or you want to have some funky symbol between them. That's fine. Um, if you're not a Lisp programmer and you want to do a simple prefix, just type the text and put it in front of it here and it'll be just a static chunk of text in front of that variable field. Um, so anything that you know how to do with blocks, you could do that here. All I want is the number to keep this simple and, and move us all along since we have are um, somewhat short on time. So I'll just pick close the block editor. I want to save it. it. Takes us back to the previous dialog box. I'll pick OK. And we don't have any labels yet because really all we did was tell it how to label things. We didn't tell it what to label. Uh, so the annotation template has been created. To insert it, you go to the annotate tab on the ribbon, map annotation, pick insert, and this will show you a list of all the annotation templates. We only have the one, so I'm just going to check the box beside number, click insert, and then just go out and pick a bunch of parcels that I would like to label. Now you can pick as many as you want. You can pick the whole thing if you, if you want to. It'll be fine. But it drops all those labels in with their account numbers. This is where you guys are excited. Ooh, ah, this is really cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, question. The uh, question was, can I use annotative text on this? And yes, you could, you could use that annotative blocks, annotative text if you want to, no real restrictions there. Uh, now this seems not super sexy or whatever, but if I was supposed to label all these by hand, that's a dang long time. I probably would have not gotten them all right because, you know, give me a day of typing eight digit numbers and I won't bat a thousand. Um, so, a nice feature, you know, labeling wise. We're, and we're leveraging some of that data that came in. Now, these are just blocks. So, if you don't like where they are, you can pick them up and move them. That, that's fine. If there's one where you don't want it, you want to erase it, just erase it. Now, the move thing gets a little bit um, complicated or dicey because of how the update works. And let's just say I wanted to pick one of these parcels and I'll right click and I'll go into properties and I wanted to change the account number on this one. And instead of whatever it is, I'm going to make it one, two, three, four, five, six. Enter. I updated the data on the object, but my label has not updated. This is one of those, if you're frantically typing regen because you think you know where I'm going, um, that's not going to help you on this one. Um, that label actually has to be updated or refreshed. And if we went to um, the map annotation panel again and pick this button that says update annotation, pick the template number, pick OK, and then I'll enter. Here is one, two, three, four, five, six. So it went out and updated all of those. So it's kind of that semi automatic thing. If there were changes, you've got to run an update and push it to that. Unfortunately, if I had picked up that text and moved it around someplace, it would have went back to its original position. So if just using the AutoCAD move command, and if I had got that whole drawing ready to plot, that would suck, um, to say the least. So if I wanted to move this ar around, so instead of like you know taking this guy, 
picking it, moving it here, oh, this looks good. But when I go back here and say update, pick it, you know, you'll see it goes back. I don't want that. There is an option on that map annotation tab, this button that says define text location. Because every object has a property to it called the text location um, that this uses. Now, when I pick that, it'll ask me to pick the object. And here's what confuses everybody, or at least it did me the first time, is you're picking the object you're labeling, not the label. And that seems a little, maybe not quite into it. I, I, my first thought was, I want the text here. I'm going to pick the text and move it here. Put it, and that makes sense, right? Um, instead, I pick the object I'm labeling, and I'll get a, a rubber band line from it. And I can say, I want the text to move over there. And then enter. And nothing happens. Other than behind the scenes, we took that entire, that label point and moved it on that object. So if I go back and do the update again, so I go back, map annotation, update, number, OK, enter, it then moves to the label point and it knows that's where it's supposed to go and it'll stay that way as long as I don't you know, um, edit that object there. Yes? It's a one, it's a pick the object, pick the point, pick the object, pick the point. It, it's which suck. Now, if you said, man, I'm looking at this one line and they all need to be moved about the same amount. Uh, there's two things I could do. I could look at my, in this case, I want the parcel at the center. When I created my, uh, my attribute in the annotation template, I, I probably, could, instead of going left justified, could have went middle center. That would that would have helped a bunch. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you, um, that you could do is you could decide, I want to just use the AutoCAD move command on them, and I'm just not going to update. You know, you know, I know that's kind of a, a hard line to draw in the sand, but if you start moving, just know the update command is not, uh, not going to be good. Yes, sir? Yeah. Let's say you spend a lot of time with half a day moving labels all around and using this uh, process, and then you want to add, you want to update the uh, template. Yes. Can you do that and it all remember where everything is set? Okay, yeah, just so everybody hears, because that's a good question. His question was you got into this process. You planned to the best of your ability, but you changed your mind later on. After moving these labels around, and you wanted to go back and edit the template and add a feature, uh, a feature to it. Um, you can absolutely do that as long as the move that you did was not the AutoCAD move. If you did the label point, it would all go, always go back to that label point that you picked. So you would be safe there. If you use the AutoCAD move command, all bets are off and uh, uh, it always goes faster the second time, right? <laughs> so. So that is kind of our quick labeling, and I'm going to keep moving because I believe we got like 20 minutes left, and I don't, I don't want to get you guys through stuff. So again, I know if you got more questions, I don't want to put you off, but I also, uh, I'll hang around afterwards so that we can, we can get to those. Um, importing civil 3D data. There, at this time, there are two things that we can do. Um, we can import uh, things as surfaces. So if you have um, contours or an Esri surface, that can be imported directly as, as a surface. Um, in the past, before this command, if you had contours, for instance, you, had, you could use the map import command, you can get polylines. Uh, the problem was all the polylines were elevation zero. Did anybody run into this? Um, and they, if you brought the data in, they would have attributes with them you could run an alter properties query and move them up to the right elevation if you knew what you were doing and then build a surface out of that. But even at best, it's quite a few steps. This is going to go directly to a civil 3D surface. 
Um, and we can import shape files as pipe networks. I know that sounded very specific, but one type of data makes one thing in this particular command at this time. Hopefully that um, will, will change here. So uh, we're going to jump into the next exercise, which is on uh, page 16 of your handout. And we're going to start this by going back to the Civil 3D workspace. So um, up at the top, change the workspace to Civil 3D. And go start a new drawing. So we'll go to the application menu and pick new. And this time we're going to use um, the AutoCAD Civil 3D Imperial NCS template, probably one that you guys have all seen because it comes with the program. So it's all, uh, so pick just the AutoCAD Civil 3D template. Since we're making Civil 3D stuff, we need, uh, we need some styles. Now to import the surface, we're going to go to the Home tab, Create Ground Data Panel, Surfaces, and hidden under there is create surface from GIS data. Go ahead and pick that. The first panel is all Civil 3D stuff. It is, what do you want to make? Now, I'm not quite sure why we have an option here, since there's one, but you won't get it wrong. So uh, surface name, we'll call it EG. Red doesn't really matter. You can call it whatever you want. We'll take the contours 2 and 10 existing style, which is the default. We'll take the default layer and just pick next. So basic civil 3D stuff there. Uh, the next tab, we're going to connect to data. And you have options with this particular command to connect to ArcSDE data, Oracle data, or a shapefile. And since we don't have ArcSDE or Oracle servers set up here, we're going to connect to a shapefile. So pick SHP. And then use the Browse button to the right of that um, to browse to our data set. Same place that we went before. Remember, when you get to my name, it's the bottom folder. And we're going to pick the shapefile contours. The, the question was, why just those three data sources? Um, that's a great question. And it's all that they have currently um, programmed. Um, so hopefully, things like that will change. But um, once you've selected that, pick login. If you picked one of the other two data sources, you'd have to obviously put in credentials for that, username, password stuff. Uh, select the one we want to bring in. So put the little checkbox beside contours there on the next panel. Uh, notice it does have a coordinate system up here as well. If that was different than the drawing coordinate system, you'd do the conversion thing again for us. And uh, pick next. You have an option here to do a geospatial query. Um, boy, that's a really long uh, way of saying area of interest or something. Uh, we're going to turn that off because we're just going to bring in the entire file. Again, if you have a county's worth of contour data that you're working off of and you only want a small area, limit the area here with those commands. Um, you can pick next. And here's the important one. Data mapping, this left-hand column, is uh, the GIS data that we were given. In our case, pretty simple. It has an elevation and a geometry field. On the right column is the Civil 3D property. So we want to say the GIS field ELEV is the Civil 3D elevation. Then just pick Finish. Um, you'll get a couple of warnings that there was a couple duplicate points on those contour lines that it found. It just skipped the duplicates. You can close that and zoom extents. And you've got a civil 3D surface. Notice it's in the prospector 
under surfaces. It looks just like other civil 3D surfaces that you might have worked with, um, but we're just directly to that, ready to go. So this is again where, ooh, ah, really cool, that was awesome, that, that went so quick. I can't, I'm sure glad I got up this early in the morning to come listen, to, to learn that, cool. Um, anyway, that is a quick way to get the surface data. Yeah. And what, now it's just like any civil 3D surface, so nothing unique there. Uh, the next piece is bring, we're gonna look at bringing in a pipe network from uh, shapefile. And that command is hidden away from us on the insert tab, go to the import panel on the far left, and it has one of those arrows at the bottom that points down that means, hey, there's more stuff under here. So expand that, and you'll see there's a command at the very bottom that says import GIS data. Now, when I, when I first saw that, I was like, import GIS data, that is this broad title that means I could bring in so many things and I could do such awesome, cool stuff. I'm so excited. Um, I'll click on that and make all my wildest GIS dreams come true. And it brings it, it uses shape files to make pipe networks. That's all it does. Now, that's, that's awesome. I don't know why the command wasn't called shape to pipe network or something like that. But, it, but I'll be the glasses half full guy this morning and I'll say this gives me hope that maybe there's plans to do more cool stuff here, not just this one. So I'm gonna be optimistic, uh, which is you know, a new thing I've been trying out. Um, uh, so shape file path. Again, there's two buttons here. The first button is the one with the little dots. That means go pick one file. The second button over is a folder, it says pick on a directory full of files. Now, based on what it does right now, and based on what we know about feature classes, which is a shape file can only be one feature class. I want pipes and structures to make my pipe network. I need two shape files, not one. So instead of using the one at a time button, I'm going to always go over and pick the folder. So pick the folder, browse to our data set. It probably doesn't remember where you were, so browse to that. And just pick the data set folder. And it's gonna be a little tough because it's not gonna show you the files that are in there because it's just picking a folder. But pick that folder, pick open, and then click connect. Connect. My thought was it could take you to the next panel or something. It just happens to highlight the rest of these so next works. So once you click connect, then pick next, and we'll see uh, some more stuff. It dumps me right into this Civil 3D pipe network stuff. And this is just Civil 3D data like we talked about before. So name the pipe network. You can call it sanitary sewer or whatever you want. I'll just take the default parts list. I'm gonna use sanitary sewer. This is in my template. Surface name, I'll go ahead and use EG since it's here, we can reference that. I don't have an alignment and that's okay. And I can pick a couple of label styles that I might want to use with this. And literally pick whatever label styles you want. This exercise is to show you how to get the data in, what it looks like is a civil 3D thing that we could talk about later in the interest of time. Um, I'm going to pick next. It shows me a list of all the shape files that are in the folder that I pointed to. So you should have uh, five of them there. We're not gonna use all five of them, but they're there. I'll pick next. And here's where the real work begins. I have data mapping for the pipes. So I have to first at the top tell it, import pipe feature class from, and it gives me three options. Now it gave me three options there instead of five. We just saw five files on the previous screen. Anybody got an idea why we um, went to three instead of five? Feature class, yeah. Um, these are the linear shape files. So these are the only things it could make pipes out of. But I don't want it to be contours, which alphabetically was up at the top. I'm gonna make sure I pick pipes out of that list. 
and they're going to be circular, and then pick add, and that adds that shapefile into uh, the list below. Then we get a list of all the different properties that we can assign uh, from the GIS data to the Civil 3D pipe network. And this is on page 26 for you, if you um, because this, we have a few steps here. If I go up to the top and we just work top to bottom, I can see stuff like um, geometry. So start structure. Under that, I'll go to the list of input data and I'll pick the thing called uh, struct start. End structure will be struct end. S slope it found for me. Start invert elevation is going to be start invert. End invert elevation is going to be end invert. As I scroll down that list, you'll see there's things like hydraulic properties. If you had hydraulic data in your GIS model and it was available, you could assign it here. All the way at the bottom is inner diameter, and that should be um, um, inside DIA. And that's all the data we have that we really want to map. But that will vary based on where your data came from. We'll pick next. Everybody with me there? That was the big one. The next panel is structures. We basically have to do the same thing for the structures. Now, the folder that we were in only had one file that was point related, so that's correct at the top. Our structure type will be cylindrical. Pick add. I'll scroll up to the top and we'll look at the data we have here. I have my rim elevation that I can set to rim ELEV. Sump elevation I can set to sump ELEV. That's actually all the data that I have in this particular file available that, that I would want to map. Um, notice I don't have everything. I don't have like structure diameter or type or you know, something that's going to match up with the um, uh, with the parts list. So when I click next, I'm actually going to get a warning. This isn't an error. It's just telling me it didn't have structure information to match up with a part. So in that case, I'm just going to use the default shape. Um, I'll quick click next. Query options, I'll just bring in everything. I'll click next. Cleanup. It can discard unlinked pipes and structures. There's also an option here to snap pipes and structures together if they're not connected and a tolerance. Now what I've found for most of the files that I work with, for some reason, it only connects them if I turn that on. And I can use the default value of 0 .0015 and that will make them connect. And I'm pretty sure that my GIS data is probably not any more accurate than you know, than that anyway, so I'm not hurting anything, but I've had much better luck turning that on than not. Click finish. It imports the GIS data. It'll tell you that it swapped out those parts, but if we zoom in, there we have a pipe network. Wow, sweet, that's really cool, awesome. Um, I'm, I'm glad I'm staying for the whole end of this class to see that. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, the one thing that you'll notice if you look very closely here is that more often than not, it actually it, um, it put the, the pipe network in backwards. My inverts in are below my inverts out. Um, not a big deal. You can, you can reverse the, the network. Just um, go to modify, pipe network. That brings up another ribbon. There's a modify panel. Underneath that, there's change flow direction. If I did that, and it says pick the upstream one, that's going to be structure five. Pick the downstream one, that's going to be structure one. Enter. It updates. My labels still don't look right, so I regen. 
And there we go, in is above out now. Uh, I went to the modify panel, pipe network, that brings up another ribbon, and then I went to the modify panel on it and expanded it and did change flow direction. And that's in the handout for you guys too, so everything is, um, is there. Um, I know we are super short on time. Um, I'm going to run in here and do the connect exercise for you. If you want to do this with me, you can. I'm going to go pretty quick, but it's in the handout for you just so that you get to see it. Um, those of you who are in uh, the, the part two this afternoon, you'll see that too. But I'm going to uh, make a new drawing from the ACAD template. So new blank drawing, and we will switch over to the planning and analysis workspace again. And the thing that doesn't show up that I want to see is the map task pane. It's kind of the prospector for AutoCAD map. If I go to the view tab, it actually shows me under palettes that the task pane is turned on, even though it's not. So if I click it once and then click it again, it comes on. So it's there. You know, it's you'll turn it off, turn it back on, it'll it'll go. But this display manager is what's important. If I pick the data button, connect to data, here you're going to see a whole different list of types of data that you can connect to. It's different than the import. This does include things like the geodatabase for someone who asked over here um, um, earlier. Um, I'm gonna pick shapefile because what I'm going to do is import the same parcel file that we, or I'll connect to the same file we imported. That way you can really kind of compare apples to apples. So I'm going to go browse to this, I'll pick parcels, and then connect to it. When we connect to it, it shows me the coordinate system again, I'll just pick add to map, and that easy, we're done. Um, you've got a connection. Now, not AutoCAD objects, not on AutoCAD layers. So you got to have AutoCAD map to deal with these. Because Autodesk, again, loves to use the same word to mean many different things, they call this thing in the display manager here they have highlighted, they call it a layer, which is great. Um, it's not an AutoCAD layer. I kind of refer to it as a feature layer or a display manager layer. When I pick that, I can pick style up above not a civil 3D style, a feature style, but I could change things like the color and pick, you know, blue or whatever and apply that. Um, I could do thematic mapping here, which we'll talk about in, in level two. I can also pick a table and I can see a table for all the data. So if I was to just pick one of the rows, it finds the parcel for me and highlights it. If instead I pick a parcel, it goes and finds it in the table. So very easy to work with. This is a direct connection. So if the file that you have connected to changes, it will update, kind of like an XREF. Um, if you have permissions to change this, and it's based on that login stuff that we you know, had saw earlier, um, uh, this, this can be edited and it would change the source file that you're connected to. So this could be a more real-time, live thing. It's just a little bit, um, uh, it's not AutoCAD data. So as far as you, know, you sharing it with other people might not be quite as easy. But for background information, it's great. It also handles really large data sets pretty well. So that's a good thing too. So with that, because I know we are right on the end of time here, I'm gonna, we did, we did this. A few other tools that you might be really interested in. I mean, if you like some of this map stuff, type stuff or this GIS type stuff, there's some great tools here uh, within those. Um, I promised you guys I'd give away a book before we leave. So uh, they should have handed you one of my business cards when you came in. That was not just um, shameless self-promotion. Um, it, it had something to do with us giving this away. So uh, this, um, give me a number between one and five.
three, okay, right in between. Thank you. We got the engineering um, end of things here. Um, uh, does anybody have number three written on the back of your card? And you're, you're hurriedly writing it on there now, I see. That too, uh, um, and it's not yours. No, we have no number threes. What? No, it says 3D, yes. No, handwritten, like a third grader, like I did this morning. Um, no, you, no. Um, okay, we'll go two. Anybody got two? We got two in the back? All right, you are our big winner. Um, see me afterwards, I'll give you all, I've got a book for you. Um, if anybody else wants to take a look at some, I've got, I've got one here, you can, t you can take a look at it. Uh, the keynote, I believe, is coming up uh, soon. Um, everybody planning to go to the keynote today? Yeah? Um, if you are interested in this stuff, I have no specific information, but my spidey senses have been tingling. I think there might be some cool information there about stuff. So, um, so, che so check it out. Um, if any of you are coming to the level two one this afternoon, um, look forward to seeing you there. If not, I hope you have a great week at AU. Uh, fill out those class surveys if you get a chance. Thanks a lot.